this is uh, a really important discussion tonight uh, that we're going to be having around the recent COP28 uh, meetings that were, were held. Um, and our guest speaker was present at those, uh, Candace Owley. Before we begin with Candace's reflections on her experience there, Okay, well, it's nice to meet all of you. And uh, so let me say a little bit about who I am. So as you know, my name is Candace Owley. Uh, I retired in early 2020 after 40 years of being the uh, president of the Wisconsin Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals. Before that, I was a nurse. Uh, and uh, uh, that was a labor organization in uh, uh, in Wisconsin, representing nurses and healthcare workers, of course. And uh, uh, we were affiliated with American Federation of Teachers. And as such, I was also on the National Executive Board for 40 years of the American Federation of Teachers, chairing their uh, healthcare uh, program and policy division. And in the last dozen years of my career, I was elected as the US representative to a global union federation uh, uh, called Public Services International, and we represented 30 million or so, give or take, uh, workers, primarily healthcare workers in all of the regions of the world. Um, so that's kind of my background. I should, it's an aside, but I just wanted to mention my daughter, who at, uh, in grade school, began shaming me about not caring more about the environment is now an environmental law professor at the University of Miami, and she goes to COP every year since Paris. So she is an actual expert in this, uh, in this area. Uh, and she has a group that works on what would four degrees look like. So they have, a, she's not a very, she, she's, a, she's a very upbeat person, but she's very pessimistic about wh where we're going as a climate. So yeah. what I wanted to cover was how, uh, how I got to COP, other than the plane, my experience as a first time attendee, my takeaways, and then some thoughts about moving forward. So the League of Women Voters since the inception of the UN has been um, active and supportive of the UN in a lot of different ways. But uh, over the years, it developed something called its observer program. And at first, it did send observers to the uh, U.S. Commission on the Status of Women, which meets every year in New York. And then later, it expanded to cover the COP. And so it was under that, in, in that capacity, that I was uh, a formal observer uh, for the League of Women Voters at this year's COP, first-time observer. Uh, I should say I'm also on the board of directors of the uh, Milwaukee County League of Women Voters and on their state and local committees that focus on climate and health. Um, so you guys know, and I'm going to even say maybe more than me, but I have to say when I told people I was going to Dubai, people are going, oh, you're going shopping, uh, which I don't do. And so there it was clear that the vast majority, huge majority of people really had no idea what I was talking about. And, and you know, they're going about their business, they're feeding their family, they're going to their jobs. And so while some of us get kind of like into this and into the weeds of it, it's kind of important to remember that, geez, you know, it's a lot of people just don't know what, what this is that we're even talking about tonight. I, I don't, I shouldn't probably do this, but make sure on the same page, just a point of saying that it, it was 1992 when the UN first established what was called the Global Convention Regarding Climate Problems, not yet called the crisis. And that uh, at that time, 197 countries, um, remarkably, including the United States under George H.W. Bush ratified that convention. Of course, the last time we ever ratified anything. Uh, and in 95, they held their first meeting of these parties that had signed on to this convention. And so it was called the Conference of the Parties or COP. Uh, and it met every year, uh, even though mm, there wasn't a lot of publicity, but I'm sure in the early years, but a lot of people kind of knew something happened uh, in 2015 because there was the Paris meeting. And that's where you were just talking about the uh, agreement that we should uh, 
keep below two degrees and really aim for 1.5, which I kept hearing 1.5 is our North Star, or 1.5 is our North Star. Uh, and that going beyond that had uh, increasingly uh, devastating impact on, on uh, people, animals, plants, everything. So that has been, you know, uh, their, in their lingo and in their goal since then. Each country then set voluntary actions to accomplish that goal. And it's just a, you know, you guys know this, but the UN is a voluntary consensus organization, which makes it, uh, does not impose things on countries. And uh, so that's important to understand when you're thinking about the fact that you have to get the United States and Canada, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia to try to come together in the common cause for a common document. Difficult. Uh, so COP28 for me, um, I think, oh, I'm going to a conference. You get a brochure. It tells you what's happening. No, it's not like any conference I ever attended. It's very complicated. It was about 90,000 people. It was the largest one ever. It has its own language, its own abbreviations. You can get way into the weeds on some of these things. Uh, there are dozens of negotiations taking place uh, in the first week, which is when I was there, in putting together documents that will begin given to the, the country leaders for the final negotiations on the final documents. And these uh, are taking place uh, every day in all kinds of rooms. They're dealing with mitigation, adaptation, financing, a path to something called just transition and, and something called uh, loss and damages. The two things I'll talk about in a minute. So the negotiations take place with countries, uh, representatives from countries. So observers have no role actually other than to observe which at, at some level I thought was kind of boring, but many observers do meet with their governments. I, I, I had some, I met with some interest groups around labor rights, women's rights and human rights. And they all had very specific languages that they were working to get included in all of the documents. And, and then many of them were then pressuring their governments to include the language in the final documents. I did not meet with our US representatives. From the labor standpoint, of which I was uh, in that caucus quite a bit, they said you don't need to meet with them. They are like one of the strongest. This this current delegation uh, was one of the strongest um, ones on language related to workers and workers' rights. So, in addition to, uh, well, I, I should say, you know, it, it's it's harder than it sounds because there are many countries that actually outlaw any form of worker representation. And so you're trying to get them to sign on and they don't even want the language of workers in there. Uh, so in addition to negotiations, there are literally thousands of other events. There were these buildings called pavilions. Some of them were single countries like Canada and the United States and the Latin American countries and so on. And others were, were organizations. So the World Health Organization was in a pavilion. They were within pavilions. There was the uh, World Wildlife Foundation, the Rotary. Weirdly, OPEC had one there for the first time. A lot of ocean-related organizations, food-related, farming, waste. Um, and uh, there was a, well, I actually went to one whole program, Joel like this, where about I don't know, 30 countries sat around a table discussing how to transition to uh, electric vehicles, whether it was, you know, bikes and trikes, if you call it in India, or the cars in, in like our country and so on. Uh, and, uh, uh, and one of the finest ones was a pavilion for youth and culture, and they had movies and and artwork that was, you know, brilliantly, you know, raising issues in a very graphic way around health. But again, I said, it's not like any conference because no, there was no centralized listing of this stuff. And the formal things were not published until the day of the event. And I mean, like day one, you got day ones and you couldn't see day two. So every morning you had to like download and look at 
what is taking place, where are their negotiations, where are their side events, and so on. In all of these, in all these pavilions, you really had no idea unless you went to the pavilion and asked. And so in the culture pavilion, they said, oh, well, our program is on Instagram. You have to sign on to Instagram. And another is, oh, you have to get the QR code for our program. So it is, as I was told, I should pick my lanes and try to get, you know, kind of get a lot of knowledge about some things and not try to figure out how to cover all this stuff. Um, so that was like the general experience. Now, prior to the start of COP, the, the, and I know, again, I, ha I hate to be talking to the people who know more than me, but the highly respected uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, as is the case, issued a report that uh, listed out the devastating consequence of the rising greenhouse gases, and it made clear that the countries were falling short of the commitments that they had made, and really pretty stark terms about the consequences if, uh, if they continued on that path. And as one climate activist uh, put it, the floods and the wildfires have, have uh, 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 it's, it's clear now that not only the poor countries, but the rich countries are facing some of the gravity of the climate catastrophes. And it's, you know, somewhat the magnitude of how bad things have come that really were driving the negotiations. Now, I'd like to think it was also these very wonderful, emotional, tear-breaking, uh, um, yes, yes, those clubs, I mean, they were all within, they didn't all have booths, but I mean, I see the little note. I'll come back on those. Um, there were these great presentations, especially by the island countries, because their whole countries are going to be underwater. They're going to have death and massive dislocation of their population. And, and you know, for a moment, people were like, oh, this is awful. And then, of course, I think they just go about their business. So it's heartbreaking, you know, but maybe that influences somewhat. So Dubai was the 28th COP, which meant it took 28 years of climate negotiations for world leaders to even use the world, mention fossil fuel in their final documents. The agreement called for the world to transition the global economy away from fossil fuels, which of course many people felt was weak and in, insufficient to the task. But even Bill McC Kevin, I read, said that he thought it was a positive step forward because it helps support our campaigns in our country to fight to stop fossil fuels in our country, the funding of fossil fuels. So in addition to the language that uh, regarding the phasing out of fossil fuels, fuels, which got a lot of attention, but there were a lot of other things that happened. There was an agreement that called for the tripling of renewable energy by 2030 for the uh, recognition of the climate change threats to the ecosystem and calling for a, a halt of all deforestation and forest degradation by 2030. At some level though, to accomplish these things, it needs massive financial investment. We know this from our country because we need a bunch of money to do our transition here. And of course there are all these countries in much worse shape that need a lot of money. And so where will that come from? So there was this agreement at the last COP to establish something called the loss and damages, or maybe it's damages and loss uh, fund, but no money was committed at that time. So the first day of this COP, there was a big announcement that uh, a number of countries had pledged to put uh, 700 million into the, uh, into the fund. The United States, pledged 17 million. And of course that sounds, and it is very puny. And I heard a lot of people, especially calling out uh, the US for, for not putting in their fair share. But you know, one has to remember that Biden can't get this money without congressional approval. So will we even get the 17 million under current situations? Uh, but it is far, far short of the uh, 400 billion or more. Now we're talking about 700 million. Now that was supposed to be the seed money and then more was to come in. But you know, 700 million, 400 billion, big gap. It's also the fact that we need this bond is also a sign of a failure because of course, if we had taken appropriate action over these 30 years, we wouldn't really need a massive fund to deal with uh, damages. You know, you have this channel of try to mitigate. No, now adapt. No. Okay. Now we're paying because 
of the damages. Um, one area that that uh, was important that got you know some attention, I think, here was the issue of methane because the United States used the opportunity to announce that the EPA had these uh, new uh, regulations that are going to crack down on methane leaks. And while I haven't heard that much about methane, of course, maybe I haven't paid the right attention. It is, uh, as you all know, probably know, the second most abundant greenhouse gas, and it contributes to more than a quarter of global warming. So if one could, uh, and that is, of course, always the question about how do you plug all these leaks, but if you could take this on, you could make you know, some significant movement. And the president of the Environmental Defense Fund uh, even called the policy the most impactful climate rule that the U.S. has ever adopted in terms of addressing climate change. Now, the Biden administration feels they're on solid legal ground with this, but I think it's no surprise that the Republican attorneys general have already uh, announced their plan to fight, fight these new regulations. So an area near and dear to me was health care, and uh, there was a whole day, the first day ever, uh, called the Health Day at COP. It was something that the World Health Organization had pushed for, for I think 28 years. And it was led by the World Health Organization to let the world know that the climate crisis is the single biggest health threat to humanity. To bring attention to that health crisis, they had produced and then was adopted a declaration on climate and health. And over a hundred countries sent their top first time ever since their top uh, health ministers to participate in, in this day, uh, this health day at COP. And the report talks about, of course, many of the negative uh, impacts of climate change and the need to, in the developing world, to really strengthen their health systems. Also the need for early warning systems, particularly warning systems that we're gonna, about heat, we don't think about that too much, but you know, uh, warning systems about heat, warning systems about the level of air pollution that you have, floods, and so on. Um, and their message was clear that climate change is killing us and urgent action is needed, and that health is the human face of the climate crisis. Uh, Dr. Tedris, who's the head of the WHO, uh, really made a pitch or a plea or whatever you'd want to call it, to healthcare leaders and practitioners like nurses, like me, that we have an ethical responsibility and we have public trust in order to be the ones who make the crisis real to policymakers and the public by using this public face of climate. He says he believes that it's a, a game changer, that yes, yes, people care about polar bears, but they really care about children dying from asthma and that we have to change that up and make that um, uh, in all of what we do of talking about that. The, on, separate from COP, but on point, just like a week ago, the Journal of American Medicine just announced that they're gonna have a new focus on climate and health. They're gonna be putting out videos and publishing many articles now on the health impact of climate, which I think is great and it'll be very useful for all of us, but again, these are signs of how bad it has gotten that this attention is being paid. Because I'm a labor union person, I went to the group that focused on um, trade union issues and they focus on something called just transition, which is a concept that the human rights groups also uh, uh, found um, uh, that was very important they were pushing for. From a labor standpoint, it's about uh, just transition has to do with the impact on workers uh, as and communities as you move away from the world of today, uh, the fossil fuel world of today, into the green jobs and renewable energy of tomorrow. There's no dispute that this is going to be massive uh, job displacement. There will be thousands of new jobs created, thousands of jobs eliminated, and they won't automatically be the jobs created won't automatically be where the jobs are being lost. So just transition idea is that you've got to create systems that mean that people are losing their jobs, will be trained and supported, and you look to put the new jobs in the communities where their jobs are being lost. So factories closing, factory 
renewable factory opening in that same community. And um, without that, they said, you know, we just transition. It is not just transition. Uh, and uh, so again, in order to do that, we need to have significant investment in training and in uh, and in um, involvement of the workers in the community themselves in, in these transition uh, discussions. And honestly, if the workers, communities are not part of this huge shift, then you're going to have massive resistance to the change. But if they are part and they can support it, they will be champions and advocates of the transition. And just to mention briefly that the, you know, the UAW strike was uh, in part over this very issue. Uh, and digressing, NAFTA did not do this right. And the job loss and such led to some very bad political consequences of what happened there. Um, there was a gender day. Uh, Hillary ran a whole day that was, they said it was the first ever day devoted to gender. Isn't, now that was a terrible sadness to me, but you should know she is still hugely popular on the global with the women from the global community. So standing room only for all day. Uh, and she had, you know, the whole series of people that were there and they were discussing the importance of having women at all the tables where climate uh, change is being discussed, whether it's funding or mitigation, adaptation, blah, 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 that women uh, need to be partners in tackling the global crisis. And they mentioned that in terms of jobs, this was upsetting, nine out of 10 women lack the skills needed to be hired for the new green jobs. And they stress that women of all ages from school on up need to be provided with the education and training to succeed in the new green economy. And if we don't, we will have an even more uh, widening gender wage and opportunity gap. I didn't follow food. Other people within our group, that was their issue, but it, they were excited because there was, again, a day related to food and the first ever declaration on sustainable agriculture, resilient food systems and climate action. Again, there is a report on this. It was signed by all the major countries and it outlined uh, the unprecedented, of course, the problem, adverse impacts uh, from climate, threatening the food systems, hunger, malnutrition, economic <laughs> stress. It focused on the human right or the right to food and to have a safe, sufficient and affordable food. And it affirmed that agricultural and food systems have to urgently adapt and transform in order to uh, respond to climate change. Now, it had a lot of far-reaching goals, and they, uh, there was a commitment that every year they will, starting next year, they will be looking at the goals and seeing what progress has been made. So, um, in closing, I would say that while I would, I believe, and I don't think hardly anybody would disagree with that, COP has its flaws. It's voluntary, it's hard, it's incremental, it's hard to see progress. And it, so it's, it's, you know, you have to say, is this worth it? But many, many activists, many I talked to, but many that I, I read about said, they still believe it's needed because it is the only global forum that forces the whole world to look at what's happening and to, where possible, work together uh, to look for, for solutions and changes uh, that will help uh, save our world. It's also a place where indigenous communities, of which there were many, you could see many, many groups of indigenous people, uh, human rights activists, small island activists, uh, labor activists, they at least have a chance to be there, to be in the rooms, to make their cases and to work to push for better outcomes at these uh, these meetings. I didn't get into it, but there's lots of demonstrations. I uh, mentioned to Terry, I love the one that every day they had an award that they gave out. They had a big dinosaur that danced around and they gave the, uh, the fossil fool of the day award out. Countries sometimes, uh, corporations some days. But, you know, uh, we know that the, the, the cop might important, whether it's important or not, it won't save our world and that that's really up to us. It's still far too easy for most of us to ignore the problem. 
We turn on our air conditioner when it's hot. We jump in our gas burning cars and say, well, until there's plugs, what can I do? We eat our, continue to eat our meat-based diets because, you know, we don't want to like change, right? Uh, we change out our air, fil air filters this summer when there was smoke everywhere. We close our windows and improve our air filters and go about our business. But in the meantime, every day more children are dying from chronic asthma. They didn't even, when I was a young nurse, that was not a thing. Little kids did not die from asthma. It wasn't a thing. You know, anyhow. Mosquito and tick-borne diseases are moving closer and closer to, uh, to us. Um, they're coming to our cities. Uh, disease patterns are changing and many of our communities are burning up each summer. We just have to, you know, be live in fear of what this next summer is gonna be like. And the only reason that I'm hoping, which is a negative thing to say, and I'm very apologetic, that maybe Canada will light on fire again during the Republican convention so that would be good timing. But, you know, we, I know, we know we need groups like yours, that your group, the, the group that's being established now that I'm on the, like the steering committee for, for Third Act, the Historic Sierra Club, and hundreds of others of uh, people have been working on this for their lifetime. Uh, we, uh, we need these, we need all of us to continue to pressure our own country. We have to be relentless in raising the alarm about the climate crisis. We need to provide our friends, our family, our communities with ways that they can take action, not just themselves, like, you know, getting their organic cart, but like what you do on Fridays. What can they do? How can they take action? Because otherwise it's pretty depressing. And, you know, we know this from the young people uh, that, you know, that they're pretty often listed. This is one of the signs of depression of young people is about what's happening with the climate. But no government or corporation or even advocacy group alone can save our world. Uh, each and every one of us has a role to play. Our children and our grandchildren, of which I now have five, uh, are depending on us. So um, I just say, let's not let them down. And I'm happy to answer questions. And I know somebody's going to be making some comments, uh, follow-up comments first. So thank you. Well, well our, fr our friend, uh, our friend George Stone, uh, gets five to ten minutes to be the first responder, and then we'll open it up to anybody who wants to uh, ask a question or uh, present an opinion. So, George, I'm not going to give you a long introduction because I want to get right to you. Well, first of all, I want to thank Candace for uh, an excellent presentation. A lot of great information. And it helped us kind of participate in the COP28 meeting. And so thank you very, very much, Candace. Welcome. <laughs> okay, George, what was your uh, opinion? Well, I, I, uh, I attended the uh, COP15 in, in Paris back in 1915, I, or 2015, I should say. Mm -hmm. Eileen and I attended that. Uh, and um, that, that seemed to have accomplished more at the time. but. Uh, I know my good friend and uh, scientist who visited here, Mike, Mike Mann, Michael Mann. Uh, Michael Mann uh, said, well, it is uh, weak tea at best, referring to the accomplishments of COP28. And that seems to be the general attitude of climate scientists. They are so frustrated by the lack of appreciation of the seriousness and urgency of this problem by the general public and they're frustrated by the slow progress. Now, for example, Candace pointed out that this was the first COP meeting, number 28, the first COP meeting which identified by name fossil fuels as the principal cause of greenhouse warming. Now, just think of it, they've had 27 meetings and they never pointed the finger at fossil fuels? You know, and where, where was this meeting held? Abu Dhabi, in the middle of the oil patch. Uh, this, this is, but on the other hand, almost 200 countries, I think it's 197 participated and agreed. Uh, that's really a marvelous achievement in itself. And, uh, it's the, these meetings are going to continue. It's, there's sm very small steps. And as Michael Mann said, weak tea at best for COP28, but, but 
nonetheless, they are steps. And so uh, I'm encouraged, frankly, that the process is taking place at all. Uh, think of another topic, think of another endeavor in which 200 countries, virtually all the countries on the planet, uh, meet on an annual basis looking for solutions. So I, I think it's being recognized. Let me make one last point. Not only was this the hottest year on record 2023, but uh, the number of billion dollar climate related disasters in the United States reached a record level. I think it was 20. Uh, as the climate change impacts uh, negatively impact more and more people and more and more businesses, uh, then the uh, interest in doing something about it will increase. Uh, one thing we need to do right away, and which was specified at COP28, is stop uh, subsidizing the exploration for oil and gas. Uh, mm -hmm. We still give a tax break. Uh, Exxon Mobil, you know, read $40 billion a year. Exxon Mobil doesn't have to pay. They can write off on their federal tax uh, the expenses they have for exploring for new oil and gas fields. What kind of nonsense is that? It's because too much of the Congress is in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry. And let me remind you, the fossil entrance, incidentally, if you'd like to learn more about the history of the fossil fuel industry, read Rachel Maddow's wonderful book. Uh, what's the title? Requel? No, the first oh, one. Oh, Blowout. Blowout, that's it, like an oil well blowing. Out. Wonderful history of the fossil fuel industry. But realize the fossil fuel industry is the most profitable industry in the history of humankind. And they have immense power and they've been using it. James Hansen, and I'll finish with this note. James Hansen in 1988 addressed Congress, showed them his computer model projections and showed what global warming, which it more properly should be called, that global warming was producing a steady increase in the heat content of the earth, a rise in the temperature, and he made some predictions based on his computer models of that, of that time, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. But we've known about, the point there is, we've known about this problem for a long time. And because of the influence of the money, Exxon, Mobil, and friends, we haven't done a darn thing about it. Well, let's keep pushing the cops. Let's make the steps bigger, but uh, at least we've got an avenue to follow. Thanks. Thanks, George. Uh, Eileen, do you have anything to add since we got your picture right up here? No, sorry. <laughs> I agree with that. We need to do stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right. Thanks. Incidentally, okay. Candace mentioned the University of Miami, my alma mater, the U, as we call it down in Coral Gables. All right. After my well, daughter at Coral Gables. So. Well, let's open it up. Uh, who wants to go? I see uh, uh, Dean yes. Muller. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm representing Wisconsin for Environmental Justice. We can talk about that. Hopefully we got time for that. I would think we would at some point in the meeting. Well, my question for Candace is I read in the, the news reports that the, uh, the fossil fuel industry had as many as 2,700 lobbyists there. Did you notice that? Well, you know, there were 90,000 people. So they didn't have signs on. Well, it seemed like they the were people all you could notice. I mean, it, the people you could notice were the indigenous people because they were in outfits right <laughs> so, yeah, well it certainly so indicates I, that the, the fossil fuel industry is is nervous they're scared they yes, they, they want to they, they, they want to have the, input yeah, yeah in so a negative in a way, way it's right. a good sign maybe you know to mm -hmm, say that right. they were that they are now that nervous that they have to be there right that exactly is. right mm -hmm. good presentation thank you anybody else want to jump in yeah i'd like to ask candace something <laughs> Thank you for you know, your presentation, it's very good. Um, what incentive is there for them to follow through on their pledges? Did you get any sense that they were sort of policing each other or planning on meeting again before the next year? I don't understand why they say these things once a year and then they, they just, what do they do? Just not connect again for another year? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not, again, I, I'm not, the in the weeds expert, but yes, there are meetings throughout. So I know that there are various meetings that take th place throughout the year that kind of culminate then 
you know, subsets that meet. I think I know, for instance, the, the labor groups uh, have a, a meeting. And there's documents that come out early that they look at uh, leading up to that. Now, uh, I, 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 I would only just speculate on on their incentives. One incentive is things are getting bad in all their countries. You know, mm -hmm. so there is that. There is there is, and even in the rich countries, you know, they might not be able to isolate. It is a global world, and uh, so you have that. And there is some people holding each other kind of accountable. There are reports that come out that say how whether they've how far they've gone on any of the the commitments that they've made and whether they are recommitting or not. And uh, so I suspect there's there's something in that also, you know, uh, but, you know, as as was said, there's a, a lot of money out there. But I, I just yeah. want to say something about that, though. Um, you know, it's true. There is a lot of pressure and a lot of of, of uh, you know, money and so on. But these scientists who know all this and say, what, why aren't we doing something? I just have to turn around and say, you know, the people I know aren't changing their driving habits. People I know aren't changing the, what they eat at the margins. You know, they, maybe they carry a water bottle half the time they're filling it up with, from a plastic bottle. I mean, we have to be upset. We have to make this change. We have to be, and that's why, and that's, and that's why I think it is very important to really lay out what is happening to our health. You know, what, what is going to happen to us, to us, you know, okay, there's rising waters, there's this and that. And, uh, and, you know, so, so what? So Joe asked me, oh yeah, they, every taxi was a Tesla. You know, you, you could just call up your own green taxi. There were little water things everywhere you went you know that you there was a place to fill up water bottles uh in dubai i mean that that you know so and it was polluted air to beat the band on top of it hmm. so yeah it was an interesting place to be for many many reasons julie i was interested in the reports of the final draft that came out the way that the language was um kind of massaged to make it not quite so radical. Um, for one thing, they said there'd be, they didn't talk about a phase out of fossil fuels, but a phase down of fossil fuels. Um, that nations could produce, or reduce production and consumption of fossil fuel, fuels. Not that they should, or that they have to, but they, they could. And uh, there was an emphasis on more technological fixes. Um, there was um, there were kind of new, a lot of these technological fixes were kind of like new ways for big corporations to make money off of this whole uh, crisis that we're in. And that the technologies really can become a distraction from massively reducing fossil fuels. But I agree with, with George Stone that it's just appalling that after 27 years, they never even used the words fossil fuel before at these conference. No, I just uh, well, fossil know. fuel is, is 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 a lot of fossil fuel talked about. You know, there's a lot of there's coalitions on fossil fuels, everything else, but getting in the final document to say that there will be taking action on fossil fuel. Right. That was first, yeah. I think there's just some, huh? Okay, great. You mentioned, at least in passing, about demonstrations. There's a lot of talk about uh, suppression of, uh, of demonstrations and dissent uh, expected at the conference. What was your takeaway on, on that overall? Well, um, all, as I understand it, all cops are required to have uh, allow a degree of demonstration. This also was an issue, of course, in Egypt. When you get to the countries that don't allow their own people to do any demonstration, of course, all demonstrations have to be within the, the circle of the, uh, of the venue. They have to be proved ahead of time. 
uh, uh, and uh, the the only the only one that I heard people expressing significant frustration over was understandably and particularly from the young people uh there was continuous demonstrations uh, uh around uh, uh gaza and the war uh in the middle east and that uh i was at a session with the guy the president uh where somebody said we feel that we're being intimidated they asked him directly uh over the issue of of um, Gaza and Palestine. And he said, for what it's worth, we are not, you, we have, you know, accepted rules. We've allowed demonstration. We do allow demonstration. If there's a problem, you let me know. So I don't know. But there were a lot of, uh, uh, there were a lot of those, those probably were slightly more spontaneous. And so the things that were not approved, you know, were were uh you know probably there was a lot of un um whenever there was a demonstration there were un uh uh representatives police maybe in the in the area so there was uh nothing was going to get out of hand i tell you that you know so hmm. thanks It'll be interesting to see what it not not next year, Azerbaijani, God help us. But uh, you know, when it goes to well, I don't know what Brazil, I mean, Brazil is like a God, you know, they they have massive demonstrations. I've been there, uh, you know, where they have hundred thousand people at a drop of a hat. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what that difference is like. So in Paris, just to say, I mean, I was in Paris, but not my daughter was at the cop, I was not. But it was the week after uh, the uh, terrorist attack, and so it was very locked down there. So I don't know. Go ahead, Charlie. Global events do kind of, you know, sprinkle into this. Well, I was just going to follow up on the question Greg raised about younger folk, younger people. I mean, did you have a chance to talk with many of them? And uh, how are they feeling about this? Are they feeling a lot of frustration and being locked out, or are they? Do they have some sense of optimism? Well, you know, I mean, I think they're not not a monolith, and so there were a lot of there were. I saw a lot of young people because I was over hanging out a little bit in the youth pavilion, uh, and what I really noticed was the you know that they have poured their their heart and soul into amazing video presentations and art presentations and street theater presentations. And so, you know, they were working on, you know, a lot of those things. I'm sure like all uh, young people, I remember some with that, but you know, they want more and they want, and they should be, they, they, they need to push more. You know, it is, it is uh, their, their passion, their energy and, and, and their, their uh, resilience uh yeah that that are critical to the work that we do so i i you know think there's always a degree of frustration you know uh i'm sure there was a degree of frustration but there was also this you know incredible spontaneous um creativity that was also uh, coming out that i just mm -hmm. loved so yeah might it also be possible that the networking opportunities there are huge oh yeah even if you know the reports don't say a whole lot they oh, yeah. say people get to meet people from other countries and they get to you know join up and, and make friends and hopefully those connections grow over time and so it's yeah. a great way for young people or anyone around the world to come together and find uh, uh, kindred souls, I would imagine, and hopefully build a stronger foundation for major society, societal change. Yeah, just on that point, some of the people in our delegation, one does, she takes groups up to the polar regions and she she was, I mean, she was networked throughout the place. She She was able to connect to so many people for the work that she is doing you know, around what's happening in the polar uh, caps. And so she she felt successful. Great. Not happy maybe about the language at the end of the day, but there were so many uh, people, like-minded people that she was able to connect to. So very much on your point, Charlie. Great, thank you.
Dan, this can you comment on uh, how people in the developing world felt about um, the results and uh, how they were treated at the conference? Mm -hmm. Well, I I think that again, developing worlds that's kind of a broad brunch, but the island communities were very unhappy, uh, and that came out in a, I wasn't there by that time I had left, so I, you know, I didn't experience some of that end point terrible frustration because I was there for the first week and a different group came the second week. And the first week is the second week I'm told uh, is much more, there are many more uh, protests and so on. And there's, you know, this built tension that builds towards these final documents. Right. And uh, uh, so I would say earlier on, there were, although the human rights group, which, which was very young and I spent some time with them until they all got COVID. And then I was like, okay, I think I'll let you go. But they, they, uh, they were kind of frustrated from the beginning trying to get certain language in there. Uh, and so they were always working to get some improved language uh, in. And I don't know at the end of the day how they felt about it, but I did see the reports about the, the uh, island, you know, the coalition of island communities that were like, out of the room when the final gavel came down. So I'm sure that was uh, very upsetting, you know. Is it Dennis another... next, maybe? I'm Dennis? Looking... Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Candace, for that uh, great uh, presentation uh, description about what happened over there. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, given the news that came out today, that uh, we have to uh, uh, change the goalpost here. We're not even at 1.5. And uh, today, uh, maybe the news came out yesterday, but they were saying how the experts, climate, uh, the global warming experts are surprised um, as the result of the information that came out uh, this summer that things are, uh, that the environment is a lot more sensitive to these changes than they thought, and also that uh, the extremes are more dramatic than they realized. So, uh, like I said, we're just at uh, 1.5. And as far as I know, when we talked about a little bit at the last meeting, that unless we start removing the CO2 that's out there, what's already up there is, is going to cause changes that will exponentially increase. So despite all this hard work, like I said, I don't think the uh, uh, I don't think the uh, goals are nearly drastic enough. Well, certainly the actions are not up to the task yet. That's there's no doubt about that. Um, and again, I, I I put that on a wide range of not just that conference, but every day what everybody does and acknowledging everybody's part in finding solutions too. But I think raise, using these reports, you have to keep using this information to agitate. I mean, isn't that what you all do? I'm out of labor movement, so you have to you know, agitate to get change, <laughs> make people you know, educate, agitate, organize. Yeah, that's well, George, you got the American Federation of Teachers, that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is the demo. Methane, CH4, what we call natural gas. Actually, the compound methane makes up about 83% of what we call natural gas. It is about, it is indeed a very powerful, potent uh, greenhouse gas. It's about two dozen times as effective as carbon dioxide. So a little bit of methane does a lot of warming. Now, here's the great danger. Much of northern the northern hemisphere across Canada and uh, the, what was the Soviet Union across Russia, the Russian Arctic, uh, is a tundra that's been frozen, permafrost. And it as the as the planet warms, it is slowly melting. Now that that tundra, that frozen permafrost, it has a lot of organic matter in it. If that or organic matter decays in the presence of oxygen, it forms CO2, or ordinary greenhouse gas. 
if it decays in the absence of oxygen, it forms methane. And the potential for the melting tundra in the Northern Hemisphere to contribute enormous amounts of methane to the atmosphere is virtually unlimited. That's a great, great danger that we're not, we don't even talk about it. Um, well, we talk about it tonight. <laughs> I think Tom? Yeah, um, let me just say a couple things. Uh, Dean Muller and I have been talking for a long time about getting Josh Call, the Attorney General, to sue, to sue these guys, these oil companies. If you're not getting it, I encourage you to get a, 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 a an email site called Exxon News, K-N-E-W-S. Exxon News does two things. It talks about the, the six cases that are out there, two of whom are going to trial within the next year, to, f to fine the oil companies for the damage they're causing. Just like tobacco companies and pharmacology companies are sued for the damage they cause to people if you haven't contacted Josh Call yet, please do so. I've been to two of his fundraisers, which are you know expensive to go to, but I've talked to him at each one saying, you got to get in there. And he he's dealing, and I understand his position, he's dealing with, um, uh, with uh, uh, women's rights and the gerrymandering. Those are his priorities right now, and I understand that. But but Exxon News, K-N-E-W-S, is one gold site. The other one that I found is called Climate Files. Climate Files is 671 of the internal documents of the oil companies. And I've gotten up, and it starts at about 1953, and I've gotten up to the early 80s. And that's, But there's one scientist in 1980 who worked for Exxon who told the truth. And his crunch number is 2037. When he looked at the damages that are going to start happening, his crunch number is 2037, the year 2037. Now, I don't think I'll be around then, but my kid will be around then. And so if you haven't contacted Josh Call, and I've talked to him, Dean and I were there, we talked to his staff about this, because uh, uh, Dan there is working working with low-income people to kind of move their houses, so uh, their weatherization, and get that going. Where's the money going to come from? It's got, I'm getting my speech. I'm sorry, I'm going too much. Where's it going to come from? The oil companies. If Josh Call has got them on the carpet and on in court, that's where the money's going to come from to shift this whole state economy. So that's what I, I, I'm, you see, I get okay, excited I have... about this too. So I'm going to shut up. I see Dean has his hand up. Go ahead, right, Dean. Right, right. Uh, Tom, and that, I agree with everything you said. I think everybody in, on this call agrees with what you said. And I guess the, the thing that I would implore this group is that Wisconsin for Environmental Justice is basically a conduit for action. As Tom mentioned, our, our purpose, first of all, is to educate. As Candace quite frankly pointed out, people still don't get the connection between fossil fuel and, and climate change and what we live with today, whether it's the hottest summer ever or maybe the mildest winter ever, who knows? All those things that need to be explained and, and got out and for people to understand it. So an educational component is number one thing we're about. The second thing is, is litigation. Litigation is, is the principal avenue that we're looking for to bring about change. We're not only looking for uh, Josh Call to do this, but we're also approaching cities and counties across the state to do the same thing. Because when you think about it, cities and counties are on the front lines of this. And they they need money in order to deal with some of the costs of, of what the fossil fuel uh, and climate change has brought to them. So what I'm imploring this group to do at 350 is to sign on as a sponsoring and, and an organization that supports our petition. It's on our website. Uh, you still have not done that. You need to do that. Uh, uh, I hate to call you out, but uh, 350 Madison already did that. So you guys need to do that. And you also need to sign on as individuals too, because the more people we have on that petition, the more strength we have to talk to, uh, you know, uh, county officials, city officials across the state. Uh, and, you know, we think we have a positive response from the city of Milwaukee and the uh, uh, Milwaukee County uh, and uh, Dane County. Uh, and 
you know, but but it can't be just a Madison uh, Milwaukee type thing. We we have to we're we're on the process of talking to some uh, what do you want to call them uh, red counties and uh, I, I think a lot of mayors out there I wouldn't call them red by any means because they're very progressive in terms of like La Crosse, Wausau, Green Bay, etc. So you know th that that's what we're about and that's what we're trying to push and get done here. The other thing that's going to happen too is that we're we're in the process of rolling out sometime in the next month or two a, an in depth study which will point to the causes, or excuse me, not the cause, but the cost of climate change. In other words, all this data is out there and it's being collected and put it into one report. So you can dial it up and look for the city of Milwaukee or whatever zip code you're in and see, well, what are the costs of climate change in my area? And it is very compelling. And, you know, it's, 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 you know, we're, we're uh, waiting on that. And, you know, we want a big rollout, you know, we want a lot of press to, to be associated with that. So that should be happening hopefully in the next month or so. So we look for that. So that's what I implore the, uh, this organization to do, because I know you do great work. You do a lot of action, protest, whatever, but this is just another lever to influence the system. Bravo thanks, and thanks, Steve. Dean, for organizing and uh, driving this initiative. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to thank Tom for his involvement and George and Karen, who's on the call here too. All have been active in terms of moving this organization to the point we're at right now. Thank you, thank you. Go ahead, Julie. Well, I just Julie. wanted to also thank uh, thank Dean and Tom for the work in this area. And it's important that we use many different tools and many different avenues to attack this problem. There's no one right way or one best way. I think we uh, everything from our own personal lives to really striking hard at the corporations uh, through yeah, legal means. Yeah. And boy, Julie, I, I, I couldn't agree more. You're absolutely right. We need to pull every conceivable lever and use every avenue of influence. It's that big a problem. No question about it. And if I might on that, you know, the, uh, you all know this, but, uh, you, you know, the children's uh, uh, case uh, came out of Montana, but, you know, they're doing them in every state where they can, where they make sense. Because I know one of my daughters, uh, her TA is one of the litigants in Florida. But also, interestingly, I don't think we'd have the same chance here, but on the first time ever in, in England, the death certificate said air pollution was the cause of death for a child. And in that country, when, when you list a cause of death, you have to list remedial action. And it is now leading to, so that was a pretty interesting novel uh, approach. So this whole the idea of saying, Many approaches, many levers, uh, some litigation, some action, definitely education. So, Greg, go go first. Yeah, Dean, two things. First of all, would you send that uh, petition information to three five zero mke at gmail? Uh, so get it in front of us at least. Um, and the second, you talked about uh, educating people, which is something that we've been trying to do for years. Uh, what methods are you using to get the word out to people? And as, as Candace pointed out, uh, you know, she'd said, uh, she mentioned she was going to Dubai. Uh, you know, people didn't know what the uh, excl <clears throat> expletive uh, she was talking about. Um, and that is generally true. I would say that 90 to 95 percent of the people that I know uh, really don't comprehend what it is that we're talking about. How do you, as an organization or even personally, reach those people? Well, I guess the first, uh, the, the short answer is uh, certainly we rely on social media and we're getting better at that. We're building that out as quickly as we possibly can. If you're building a statewide organization and trying to, to do it quickly, uh, that, that's a primary goal. The other thing uh, is to connect with other organized networks. Uh, we've had conversations with Building Unity and also the Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice. So again, those are organizations that have done a ma fabulous job of organizing and building coalitions of, of social justice groups. And this, of course, is very much in their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. We're not forgetting about faith groups either because there's a lot of coalitions that center around faith and uh, social justice. And uh, But also, of course, we mentioned youth a number of times in this uh, meeting, and of course, that's the way we can connect with uh, the youth uh, uh, very quickly. But certainly, I think we're all coming out of the foxhole 
after the COVID foxhole, if you want to call it that, in terms of face-to-face -face meetings. I'm certainly uh, available to make presentations. We'd be happy to do that. And uh, just to explain the whole concept of what we're talking about in terms of what is this litigation, how does it work, what are the bells and whistles of it, and so forth. And some of the groups I speak to have, you know, have a great understanding of what climate change is and how it's connected to fossil fuels. So I don't need to spend a whole lot of time talking about that. I'm preaching to the choir in some cases, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking more about the nuts and bolts of how this litigation is is put together and how, how it's moving along in different parts of the country. So, and again, I, I preface that by saying I'm not a lawyer, but you know, that that's the essence of what we're working on is very much the legal aspect. And again, like, like Tom uh, pointed out is very similar to the tobacco litigation, the opioid lit litigation, uh, the Kia lit, uh, car, you know, uh, getting broken into, uh, you know, uh, uh, the lead paint, et cetera. So cities and counties, you know, uh, have done this. And it, it's, it's not something they're, they're going to charge the taxpayers in, in legal fees to do this. They're going to retain an outside firm on a contingency basis to do this. They just need the political will to do it. That's the bottom line of this. They, they can't, okay, they can't yeah, argue all the taxpayers are going to push back because it's going to cost too much. No, it's, it's not. And of course, is it a long game? Sure. Is the checks going to come in the next six months? No. But again, there's, there's 30 entities across the country that have filed. And they're moving through the system, like Tom very accurately pointed out. And it, it, it's it's happening. It's moving. And it, it, it's, it, but it's a slow moving train. We need, just need to push it harder. Karen? Thank you. I, I think one of the problems with the education piece is that um, I would say that a lot of people are just overwhelmed, that they actually don't know what to do. It isn't that they don't necessarily know or haven't heard about this but they they concretely either don't know what to do can't afford it or are so overwhelmed with personal problems sometimes that they can't they can't act and um you know i i guess when i brought it up with people i haven't heard one of them say they didn't you know they all agree this is something that needs to happen we need to work on this but um I think we got a depressed nation in some respects. And um, and we also have a nation that's, um, our children are being um, oftentimes uh, lost in their phones and stuff. And it takes away from their ability to be present to the world and to people. And, um, you know that that's a separate separate problem we are dealing with so many issues yeah. simultaneous that um, karen if they're if they're if they're locked in their phone we're going to find them with social media okay <laughs> just make yeah. sure it's the right social media they're not on facebook exactly mm -hmm. yeah discord i guess but mm -hmm. we're working on it yeah yeah thanks and again thanks candace there was um really interesting and um, informative about what it looked like to be a participant in, in COP28. I really, really appreciate that. And I also noted a couple of things that you said. That one was, it got my, uh, popped my eyeballs, is that there's, there's a group that you reference that are trying to figure out what life is going to be like at four degrees. Um, that would be a really good thing to um, to spend some time pondering what does four degrees. I've heard that three degrees is beyond human capacity to live. Um, so th that would be very interesting. And the other thing was you kept emphasizing that what can we do? That we, we have to be able to figure out what we can do, what, what that would be productive and contributing. And I found myself really focused, if not obsessing, on if we're going to get off fossil fuels and demand that they shut fossil fuels off, we got to have something to replace them with. And we don't have any discussion in our groups here about the serious discussions about what's what's occurring as we move forward with with the climate change um 
what's what's emerging that's going to allow us to replace the absence of fossil fuels in our local, national, and global economy. And I can tell you, there's a lot of stuff going on about the new technologies, and it's going to be technology that has to be re used to replace fossil fuel. I mean, we hate the term t technology, but um, I don't know. I To replace it, we have to have we have to, to remove it, we have to replace it. And there's just a lot of new technology in in across the globe and on global industries that we could be talking about that really provides a source of of hope and optimism for what's what we're facing with climate change. It's a different dialogue of one of of opportunity. And um just one example, um, we talked about heat pumps. Heat pumps, this is technology, all right? If we're gonna get off of fossil fuel, that means we gotta turn off the gas. The sheer turning off the gas, by the way, is about $120 of um, savings to every homeowner because the gas meter itself whether you use a gas or not is the, but if you turn off the gas what are you going to heat your house with and what does that technology look like and what does it take to be able to help people make a decision about buying the, what kind of heat pump and, and the like there's a lot of social activism that could be going on in terms of trying to figure out how do we translate these new technologies into making life better for ourselves in a whole lot of different ways. And this could be a really uplifting kind of dialogue to be having rather than really um, allowing us to fall prey to a, a, um, a vicious cycle of, of loss and depression when, when there's also a virtuous cycle that seems to be emerging simultaneously. That's okay. And I just, I just on. want to point out, you, you know, that the, the, there's a bunch of money, you know, federal money coming to support heat pumps and and EVs and and solar and so on. And and also for in the Milwaukee area, you know, the city has adopted this climate and equity plan that's got a ton of things mm -hmm. in there about putting trees in, you know, to to green the heat the heat island and so because you're in this area you might want to at least organizationally make sure that that city plan gets fully implemented uh monitored and implemented and uh you know they have to pull down federal funding for it but it's the 10 big ideas plan of milwaukee city to do much of what you've talked about how to how to use uh, the issues of economic justice to create jobs uh, that help with the racial disparities and so on. So there is, just to be hopeful, there is a lot of, you know, people yeah. doing some really good work in this area uh, right along the things that you've, you've mentioned. So. The, the, the new technologies are providing unbelievable opportunities for small business startup. And why aren't our, why aren't our nonprofits thinking about turning to these new technologies and, and see them as a way of, of promoting new startup businesses, if not cooperatives. And we can be on the front line of creating the jobs and, and the like based on these new technologies. And I, uh, it's not just getting the money from the government so that you can buy heat pumps. There's an industry that needs to be rebuilt built anew to support this technology. And these are jobs. These are the green jobs. Right. Um, but I don't hear. Dean, um, I want a Dean to get in oh, here. He's had All a right. hand up. Well, I, I, Dan, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't, I don't want to take up any more time, but, but it's, it's, it's about innovation. We have a, we're a very innovative country. We're already seeing this innovation take, take place. It's the S curve. Eventually it's going to tip honest. It's going to tip yes, it and we're going to go from, EVs to, you know, to, and, and we, we won't see gas combustion cars anymore. I mean, we went from horses to cars in a, in a decade, you know, there were horses all over the place and poop all over the place. And then, you know, 
uh, a decade later, it was all cars, okay? It's gonna be shorter and it's gonna be quicker and it's gonna happen. So we don't wanna be entirely negative, but I agree with every word you said in terms of innovation technology. We've got a good flow of money from the feds going on right now. We have an industrial policy in this country for the first time ever, as far as I can see. The whole concept of bringing manufacturing jobs back, et cetera, it's, 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 it's a work in progress and, you know, we, we we mobilized for World War II, what, two, two and a half, three years. We had nothing in, in, in that. That's a bad example in terms of we got ready to fight a war that needed to be done, I guess, in terms of fascism was on, 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 on the brink. But we made the change and we can do that. We can do that. No question about it. Jan has her hand. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Well, when, when um, Dan brought up uh, alternative to uh, or other means of getting green energy. It reminded me that uh, Miss America made a speech at uh, COP about uh, nuclear energy being in a, a way of generating green energy. And I'm wondering what kind of response there was to that and if that's even a, something that's a viable option or not. Well, I can at least comment on that because I was with some of the nuclear, uh, well, not with the nuclear people, but they have these little nuclear things now that are being developed. And uh, they were just saying it's more popular outside of the United States than in the United States. Um, but that there's a lot of movement on, on this. I was talking to a union guy that works in this area and so at the COP. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, George. Uh, as far as alternative energy goes, uh, I just want to recommend there's a go Renew Wisconsin is a very active uh, organization in that area. They've been very active. Michael Vickerman was the founder and uh, one of the drivers. They've been around 20, 25 years. They have an annual summit. It's called the Renewable Energy Summit in Madison at the Lake Mendota Center. So I strongly recommend you look that up and register and go to it. Uh, Wisconsin, I have learned by going to that conference, it has done very, very well in installing solar electricity throughout the state on farms because there are grants and reductions that you can get in the in the cost. So Wisconsin doing pretty well. Um, wind, there's great potential along along the lake, which is not being utilized for wind energy. And if you ever if you've driven recently through western Iowa, it's just covered with wind turbines. We we have a long way to go in that area, and of course. Transportation electrical cars are uh, on the upswing, although there's a long way to go on that. Nuclear fusion is a dream for uh, almost a century. Um, and it, it, so far, a practical way of uh, translating the energy from nuclear fusion into usable energy has not been well uh, identified. So that's that's a that's still a dream. I think we must have put it in that category. But there's a lot of money being spent in this research, and uh, I think we're going to do it. Uh, I just want to say, Candace, thank you so much for your presentation, and uh, this was really a great discussion. And Tom, we're going to give you the last word. Thank you. We had we peace action had a little discussion about uh, nuclears. Uh, we got two uh, retired nuclear power plants in the state of Wisconsin. The nuclear the used nuclear fuel is sitting there, and it's going to be sitting there and causing danger for ten thousand years. That's what uh, Julie. Who was that 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 talked to us about that? Ten thousand years. That's longer than, than people have been able to be alive. And that's how dangerous this stuff is. And, and I was reading in an article, what, what kind of sign can you put on this that people 5,000 years from now will say, oh, this is a dangerous thing? You know, and, and they came up with kind of uh, Mr. Yuck sign to think that that might be able to convince people 5,000 years from now that they shouldn't go around playing with this used nuclear spent fuel. Nuclear is a great idea, but it's just what, and and Nevada doesn't want it. I mean, that was the idea 20 years ago. That we're going to ship all this stuff down to Nevada. They don't think it's a good idea, even though they're a Republican and all four kinds of stuff like this. Let's ship okay. it to Texas instead. So anyway, the point of it all, that's my concern about nukes. 
uh, well, how dangerous is this going to be for the rest of our lives? Not our lives, the rest of our, uh, our people's existence. So that's my reaction. I'll shut up. Now, Tim, Thanks, let me uh, make one more comment because I didn't, I forgot to mention this, which is uh, I heard somebody talk about the churches. It was the first time ever they had a, um, a religious uh, pavilion. Pope was supposed to be there, but you may remember he got sick. But there was a huge religious contingency uh, there to to support, you know, the importance of climate change. So I do think engaging the churches uh, uh, have a high value. Some of the churches, but I mean, certainly the Pope is out there on that, you know. So, so, Amen. <laughs> we'll end on that faith note. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Yeah, right. thank you. Yes, nice. thank you. It Great was presentation. You. Thank you. Everybody take thank care. Thank you all. Stay well. Stay well. Yes. Stay, well. Yes. Okay. Stay warm. Okay.